Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the Tech Take series um, hosted at NCI. Um, before we start, I'd like to um, the National Computational Infrastructure acknowledges celebrating the pays our respect to the Ngunnawal and the Nambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Um, today, we are very grateful to have um, Dr. Stephen Sanderson from University of Queensland give a talk about the prefix sum algorithms um, and it has implemented some GPU um, X-ray uh, X-rayers. Um, Dr. St um, Stephen Sanderson is a postdoctoral research fellow in um, Professor Deborah Bernhardt's group at the Australian Institute of uh, Bioengineering and the Nanotechnology, the University of Queensland, where his study focuses on the theory behind computational methods for and the statistic, uh, statistical mechanics of uh, non-equilibrium systems. Um, so uh, a few housekeeping um, things. Uh, this um, uh, series is uh, recorded. Uh, and we will post the recording um, probably next couple of days after it's streamed. Um, I think today we have a quite a niche and advanced topic. So we have a small cohort. Uh, and I asked um, Dr. Sanderson beforehand, and he's uh, happy um, um, if you have uh, any questions during his uh, presentation. So just feel free to unmute yourself, um, uh, ask questions. In the meanwhile, I'll monitor the chat box for questions as well. Um, I would like to direct you to put question to chat box because it's uh, simpler. Uh, Q&A box is sometimes it's a bit more complicated for use um, 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 for the use of group size like ours. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll hand the floor back to you, um, Stephen. Thanks, Fred. Um, so yeah, this is a talk about uh, basically GPU implementation of the parallel prefix sum algorithm um, optimized for a specific use case. Um, and this is something that I was dealing with back during my honours, actually, honours and PhD. Um, so I first came up with this back in about 2016 and recently did some benchmarking on it just to put this talk together and make something out of it. Um, so oh, and, and I should say that that was all at James Cook University. Um, so as a bit of an overview, um, we're going to start with an introduction to prefix sums, uh, look at some parallel prefix sum algorithms, um, and then look at some optimization we can do to do better in this specific use case, and then go into some conclusions. So, firstly, what is a prefix sum? Um, fairly simple. It's just a cumulative sum over an array. So, if we have elements mu zero to seven, then the elements of the prefix sum will be the sum up to, in this case, including that element. So in my use case, I was using this as an engine for event selection behind the kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. So we have um, event sorry, rates. For, for interruption, um, Stephen, are you meaning to share screen or? Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Should have said something earlier, sorry about that. Um, All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll... As I said, we'll start with an introduction, go over some parallel algorithms, and then look what we can do better. Um, so yeah, the, the prefix sum is essentially a cumulative sum over all the elements in an array, up to and including, in this case, the element that we want. So for example, here, the, cumulative, uh, the element three will be the sum up to and including element three. So in my use case, for running a Canadian Monte Carlo engine, we want to find the first element that's greater than or equal to some fraction of the total sum. So in the Monte Carlo, that would look like each of our new j's is the rate at which some event would happen. We find the sum of all event rates in your total. We choose a random number from zero to one, apply that fraction, and then find the first element in the cumulative sum that exceeds that total. And that's the event we choose. So it might be something like this. If we have all our event rates are one, then our prefix sum will look like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if our random number was 3.5, then we choose this element here. So a simple linear implementation of that would be something like this, where we 
take the first two elements, sum them, store it in the second, sum that with the third, store it in the third, and so on, down to the end of the array. And then we'd come back and just search from the start, find the first element that's greater than our random number, and that's the one we choose. And obviously there are optimizations we can do there, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so we can immediately see that since we have sorted data, we could do a binary search. In that case, we have our lower and upper bound, calculate a midpoint, say for example, our random number falls in this bin here, then it's lower than the value at our midpoint. So the upper bound moves down, we get a new midpoint. Now it's greater, so our lower bound moves up and then we found it. Um, and we can benchmark those two things. And we see firstly, we've got a nice linear scaling as we'd expect. Um, but interestingly, the binary search isn't really any faster than doing the linear search. So th this timing is for the sum and the search. Um, so I think partly the reason for this lack of difference is that most of the time goes into doing the sum. Um, but also when we do the search in the linear case, we have nice well-defined um, memory reads. So we can get good caching behavior, speculative ex execution, all those sorts of good things. Um, Whereas in the binary search, we're jumping around between memory, our cache won't be behaving so nicely. So that may also contribute. Um, but it's not worth getting too far into because the data is on the GPU. So in my Monte Carlo code, all my event rates were calculated in parallel on the GPU since they were generally independent of each other, which makes it nice and easy. Um, and if we want to copy the data from the GPU onto the CPU to do that scan, then we incur an overhead that scales with order n. So not a great solution. Um, and I'll mention here that the benchmarking platform is the RCC's Vena cluster, which has Intel Xeon Gold CPUs and Tesla V100 GPUs. So data's on the GPU and GPUs are good at parallel. So we want to do a parallel prefix sum. Now, uh, naive implementation. Um, and I should say that from this section um, for a little bit, I'll be talking about content from this book here which is worth checking out if you're interested, although it is a little old now. Um, and so the naive implementation will take each element in a parallel thread, add to it the element before in the array and store that. Then in parallel, we take the element two before, add it and store it. Then four before, add it, store it, and so on, eight, 16, and so on, all the way through our array. So we essentially do order and log in add operations. But the linear scan only needs order and add operations. So we're definitely doing some extra work. There's probably something better that we can do. And that's where the work efficient parallel prefix sum comes in. So a guy called Guy Belloc noticed that sweeping a binary tree and performing one add operation per node will give an order n add operations in total. Um, and that looks something like this. So if we start with our array of values, we then in parallel sum two values and store them in every second. Then we sum those and store them in every fourth, sum those, store them in every eight, and so on. Um, then we can kind of build this binary tree. We then take that binary tree and do a down sweep phase where we start with just a single, take the middle one, add it to the quarter. Then we take in here and add it in and you can see how this expands down for longer arrays and we end up with a full scan. So in code, that looks something like this. So we get the index of our thread. Um, this is a CUDA GPU kernel. We get the index of our thread. We start with a block of n threads where we're, or sorry, sorry, block of chunk size over two threads, um, where chunk size is kind of the length of our array in this case. Um, so then each thread will operate on two pieces of data, do the addition, then we'll come around, synchronize, and then half the threads will operate on two pieces, then half of those operate on two pieces and so on. And that does our up sweep. We then come along and go back the other way and do our down sweep. So here we're dividing by two each step, here we're multiplying by two each step. Um, so then obviously, or if, if you know much about um, GPU coding, you know that this sync threads call only synchronizes threads within a single block. Um, and for at least modern GPUs, the block size is limited to 1,024 threads. So that means that we can only operate on up to 2,048 pieces of data um, or an array of like 2,048 with this code. Um, but what we can do 
to expand to larger arrays is something like this. So we divide the array into chunk size blocks. So this will be two times our maximum block size or whatever block size we're using. Um, we do a scan just over, or scan and prefix sum I'll use interchangeably, over just the elements in that block. And then we can do another scan over the aggregates of all those blocks, since those contain the sum of the whole block. We take those ag uh, the scanned aggregates and then add them back to the next block. And that'll end up building the whole scan in the array. Um, and in doing this scan of aggregates, if that's still longer than our block size, we can recursively do this process um, until we have a scan that actually fits within a block, walk back down, um, and then we have our full scanned array. Now, the other thing you may have noticed is that um, we're kind of limited at the moment to arrays of length that are, of length that are a power of two. Um, and it turns out the easiest way to get around that is actually to add an optimization, uh, which means talking a little bit about GPU architecture. So um, now this diagram is for an older GPU, so the exact numbers aren't necessarily accurate, but they should give a decent order of magnitude. Um, so we have host memory, which is the RAM attached to your CPU. From there, we can transfer relatively slowly to the device memory, which is the GPU's RAM. We then have somewhat faster transfer into level two cache, which is accessible by all of our parallel processes on the GPU. And then from level two cache, we can lead, uh, load into level one cache and texture memory. Um, so texture memory, you can think of it as like a constant cache. Um, so if there's values that don't change through your computation that you need to access, you can store them in texture memory for faster access. Um, and then level one cache has this interesting thing that is quite handy, which is when you launch a GPU kernel, you can specify some portion of your level one cache to be set up as shared memory, which is memory that's accessible between all of the threads within a block um, at the speed of level one cache. So we can take advantage of that. Um, so if we have a look at our algorithm again, we see that we're doing our add operations here and here. And those operations are all within a single block of threads so that we don't access the data outside of our block that we're working on. Um, so what we can do is make use of shared memory. So firstly, we declare it as extern shared. Um, and because we have a templated function, we need to do this reinterpret cast to be able to um, have temp have the same data type all the time. Um, then we can get the index of two pieces of data and load them into shared memory. Um, so now this is in level one cache and it's nice and fast to access. We then do our up sweep in the shared memory, come back to our down sweep also in the shared memory. And then just at the end, we write the result in the shared memory back to global memory or probably level two cache. Um, so then to expand to arrays of any length that aren't necessarily power of two, all we have to do is only load the data if it's within the length of the array, otherwise we just load a zero. And then when we go back to store, we just store only if it's within the length of the array, since anything beyond it was just zeros anyway, the cumulative sum's not gonna change and the world is good. So doing all that, we get this performance here. Um, so we see, as soon as we start going to large numbers, we get quite a significant improvement over the CPU algorithm. Um, and a better way to look at this is to look at it as throughput. So this is n divided by the time um, gives us the number of items in the array process per nanosecond or billions of items per second. Um, so we see here that we're getting around about a 20 something times speed up over the CPU algorithm, which is already quite nice. Um, but it turns out there's still a problem in the code um, and that's to do with how shared memory works. So shared memory is actually split into 32 banks of 32 bits each. Um, or on older GPUs, they had 16 banks, but um, we won't worry too much about that. So what happens with those banks is if we have our array here, index zero is stored in bank, bank zero, index one, bank one, and so on. And if we pretend we only have four banks, then index four would be stored in bank zero and so on. Now, if we have parallel threads trying to access the same memory bank, uh, well, firstly, if, if you have parallel threads trying to access different memory banks, then those accesses are in parallel. So we can load all of this data at once. If we have parallel threads all trying to access the same bank at the same exact memory address, that's also parallelized, not a problem. But if we have 
parallel threads trying to access the same bank, but different memory addresses, then we have a bank conflict and those uh, accesses actually get serialized. Now, why that matters, if we have a look at our upsweep algorithm, for example, here we're taking numbers and we're storing in every second element, which means that we're storing in banks one, three, one, and three. So we have a two-way bank conflict. Then when we go to the next step, we're storing in banks three and three. So we have, again, a two-way bank conflict or a uh, conflict, or if this were longer arrays with 32 banks, we'd actually have a four-way bank conflict here and then an eight-way and so on. It just gets worse and worse up the tree. Um, so we're having all of our rights being serialized. Um, but it turns out there's a simple solution, which is to pad our shared memory every time we fill up all our banks. So in, a, in this example where we have four banks, um, after the fourth index of the array, we skip one and store it in index five of our pointer. Um, so then it's in bank one. And that means that when we're writing here, we're writing to banks one, three, uh, two, and zero. Uh, is that right? Uh, Yes, one, three, two, and zero, and then three and zero, and so on. Um, and turns out that scales nicely. We can go to however long we want, and we won't run into any conflicts. So then all of our reads and writes to shared memory are now parallelized. Um, in terms of code, that essentially just looks like this. So we're taking here where we were loading our global data into shared memory. Instead, we first calculate a bank offset, which this is just the actual index divided by the number of banks. But since our number of banks is a power of two, we can just do a right shift and make things faster. Um, and that just means every time we want to access index AI of shared data, we need to calculate a bank, a bank offset first. And it's actually faster to calculate that bank's offset and do the access than it is to have that bank conflicts. So by applying that, we end up with even better performance. So now we get into almost 25 times faster. Um, now there's one other thing we can do, and that's, so, so far we've been doing this scan in place. So we haven't been using any extra memory. And that means that when we want to do the scan or the prefix sum over the aggregate of each block, we have to do a strided access to global memory. Um, and if you know much about that sort of thing, you know that generally strided accesses are bad. So what we can do instead is we actually store the aggregate as we calculate it in an auxiliary array. And then we do a scan over that auxiliary array, which is a colorless memory read. Um, it's all, it does all nice and lined up next to each other. Um, again, we'd store any, uh, any aggregates of those into another smaller auxiliary array and so on. Um, and by doing that, we can get a little bit more performance since we're reading colorless chunks of memory rather than strided access. Um, so question is, can we do better? So in implementing this algorithm, um, I noticed something about the structure of the upsweep tree, um, the data structure. And that is that essentially we can already search this. This serves all the purposes we need. We have the sum, we can apply our random fraction to it. And then what we can do is say, for example, we have uh, our random fraction ends up somewhere here. We first take this element, which is the halfway point and compare it like we would in a binary search. Um, and we see that our random number is greater than. So we take this value and we store it in a prefix counter, um, kind of the, the sum of prefixes up to where we are searching. Um, and then we step down, we take this element and we compare the prefix plus this element to our random number. We see it's also lower. So we step down to here, we add this onto our prefix. So now our prefix has the sum from zero to five. And we can pre compare that prefix plus element six to the random number. And we see that it's greater than the random number. So we choose this element. Or if it were less, we would choose this element here. If on the other hand, we come here and our random number is somewhere back here, we don't add to our prefix. And we sit down to this one and so on. So we can search this whole data structure um, by essentially doing the downsweep phase only along the path of our search. Um, and by doing that, we can skip a lot of the extra work and encode that search essentially looks like this, um, which again, we have our offset, which keeps track of where the last thing that was added to the prefix is. Um, and essentially we're searching some fraction from that offset to like within that chunk. Um, so if we do that with and without using the extra memory, we get basically a two times speed up, uh, which is really nice. And as far as my 
uh, honours and PhD work goes, this is where I left it off. And this was the code that essentially ran my Monte Carlo engine. Um, but it turns out there's always a bigger fish. So not long and around about the same time actually as when I came up with this, there was a technical report published by NVIDIA um, about an algorithm called a single pass scan with decoupled bookback, um, which is a really cool algorithm. Um, essentially what they do is for each chunk that they want to process, they'll do the initial reduction, which might be the upsweep or it might be some other kind of similar algorithm for doing the initial phase. Um, and that gives them the aggregate of the block. They then store that aggregate and set a status flag of the block to A, saying the aggregate's available. And then if it's the first block, it will store that same aggregate as the inclusive prefix as well, which is the sum up to the current, the end of the current block, um, and set the status flag, flag to P, saying the prefix is available. Now, for the later threads, of uh, uh, blocks, sorry, they'll do their um, reduction of their elements. They'll store their aggregate, and then they look back. Um, and they can look back in parallel. So if, if you have, in this example, there's six threads, so it can look back six blocks in the past. Um, and it'll read the status flag of those blocks. Then if it's a P, it'll read inclusive prefix. If it's an A, it'll read the aggregate. And then we find the latest prefix that's available, add on the aggregates of any blocks later than that. And then we include that, uh, we add that to our aggregate, store it as our inclusive prefix, and then use the inclusive prefix we have from the previous block or the sum that we've taken and add that on to our scan when we process the last part. So this way we're only touching each piece of data, we're loading it once from memory and storing it back once into memory. Um, and by doing that, they show some really fast throughput. They actually, for large N, they get essentially the same throughput as a memory copy, um, which is really impressive. Um, so I saw this and thought, okay, no way my code's faster. Um, so I benchmarked it. It turns out only kind of right. So 32-bit integers, they are slightly faster, um, but for 64-bit data, they're actually very slightly slower. Um, and it turns out the reason for that is in the minor details. So for the uh, partial prefix sum, because we don't have to come back and do and add, add the sum of the previous block onto the whole block to build the full scan, um, we're actually also only really touching those data once. Um, except we do partly touch things again in doing our scan of the aggregates. Um, now, for the partial algorithm, that scan of the aggregates needs an extra three memory transactions per chunk, plus one over chunk size, plus, or, or sorry, uh, plus three over chunk size, plus three over chunk size squared, and so on, depending on how long your array is. Once this gets down less than one, then it doesn't add anything extra. Um, but for the uh, dynamic lookback algorithm, um, the number of memory transactions per chunk actually depends on the data size. So for 64-bit data, what it needs to do is it first calculates its aggregate, it stores it, which is one transaction. It then has to do a memory fence and then stores the um, flag saying that the aggregate's, aggregate's available and it has to have a memory fence in between those so that the flag doesn't get set before the data is actually there. Otherwise you end up with a race condition. Um, then it'll look back and read a status flag, which is access uh, transaction number five. It'll read the either the aggregate or the inclusive prefix of a previous um, block, which is transaction number uh, six. Uh, sorry, that transaction number five. Um, and then it will store its inclusive prefix, do a memory fence, and update its status flag to P. Um, so that way, there's, there's at least eight transactions per chunk, possibly more if it has to poll the previous thing waiting for an aggregate to be available. Um, but they have an optimization for 32-bit data. Um, since the word size of the GPU is 64 bits, it means you can write 64 bits atomically. Um, and that means that the status flag and the aggregate or, or inclusive prefix can actually be stored within the same 64-bit word. Um, so what they do, instead of having to have a memory fence in between, 
they can just have the one memory location which will either contain the aggregate and flag or includes prefix and flag and they just write both to that one memory location in a single transaction and in that case they just need to write the aggregate and flag which is one transaction look back and read an aggregate and flag bundle which is one transaction and then write the prefix and flag uh, which is one transaction um, so in total there's three plus maybe some more of as to hold um, so that's why for 32 bit data they're slightly faster since they're a little bit less than our three plus a little bit um, but for 64 bit it's a little bit slower um, but it turns out we can actually do even better um, and this from here on this is things that can be applied to all of the algorithms um, i thought would be interesting to point out so what we can do since we only care about searching the thing and we don't care about actually having the prefix sum in place um, when we load our data into shared memory instead of just loading a single value we can try to load two values that are consecutive and add them together straight away and then we do our scan on the shared memory as before and then right back to a different array um, since we now need to preserve that initial input array to be able to search it, uh, do the last stage of the search. Um, we write to a, a different array. Um, and those here, we're only writing half n in total. So essentially, we're taking a quarter of our roughly um, memory transactions off the table. Um, so that looks something like this we have our input, we sum two elements and store them. Then we do our normal. Um, Upsweep over all those elements. So then we store in this one, this one, that, 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 and that. Um, and that gives us a boost in performance because we have less memory transactions. So we, we can see that we definitely memory downed in this uh, problem. Um, and now there is actually one more thing we can do here. And that's um, our, since at the moment we're loading in two consecutive elements per thread. So our first thread, which we'll call green, is loading two. Next thread loads two, and so on. Um, so because each thread can only kind of do one thing at a time, um, we're essentially really doing a stride of memory access. Um, but what we can do is instead change the order of the loading so that we're doing coalesced reads instead. And then it looks more like this. Um, so we're fetching whole cache lines at a time. Um, in code, that's essentially looks like this. So we calculate four elements that are each the number of threads per block apart. Um, we store those all in shared memory. And in this case, we need twice as much shared memory to do it. We synchronize, we then calculate the index of two consecutive elements that we're going to store. Um, we store those in registers, synchronize again to make sure everything has it stored in registers. And then we store those sums back in just the first half of shared memory, which we then do a scan on and so on as before. And for 32 bit integers, that gets us a little bit more, more performance again. Um, for 64 bit, there's a small increase, not quite as much, I think, because the cache line size, um, at least on the GPU I was using, is 128 uh, bytes um, for memory. So, um, in the case of floating point numbers, when you have a warp of 32 threads, you essentially need two cache lines. Um, so, I think there's something going on there with it not quite being as beneficial. Um, but it's still worth doing. And in this strategy of only writing out half the data, um, we could take it further and say, read um, eight things per thread instead of four. Um, and that would get us even more speed up. Um, but at some point we start getting diminishing returns, partly because we start running out of cache um, if we're doing uh, coalesce reads. Um, but even if we were to avoid that and just use the same amount of cache as before, at some point, we'll start not being memory bound anymore since we're doing a kind of serial um, scan of whatever elements we're loading. Um, and our searching will also become slower at that point since we have to kind of redo that scan once we get to the last stage. Um, now I haven't got into the details of that, but it's something that if you're interested, you could try to look into. Um, so to draw some conclusions, uh, firstly, we've seen that the parallel prefix sum is much faster than the linear algorithm, especially when the data is already on the GPU. Um, and actually the decoupled lookback algorithm, uh, algorithm is even faster again. Um, we also saw that if we only care about doing the sum and search, we don't actually care about having a fully scanned array, then we can skip the downsweep 
in the parallel prefix sum, and that gives us a two times speed up over the um, work efficient algorithm, um, and gives us performance on par with the implementation in CUB with the dynamic lookback. Um, we also saw that by using extra memory, um, both for avoiding strided access and for uh, loading more data per thread, um, we can avoid writes and get even more speed up. And that kind of leads us to the main kind of point of this talk, which is that when you're writing GPU algorithms, optimizing memory transactions uh, can provide a significant speed up, especially when you're processing large amounts of data. Um, and some general rules of thumb are to avoid transactions to global memory or even to level two cache wherever possible, um, to use coalesced memory fetches wherever you can, um, and to use shared memory whenever you can um, if you're accessing the same data multiple times within the same block. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors during this work, Ron White and Bronson Felper. Um, that was at JCU. I'd like to thank the RCC for their compute resources in doing all this benchmarking. Um, and I'd like to thank Jingbo and NCI for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's nice to talk about this sort of thing. Um, and finally, if anyone's interested, the source code is available here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, that was quite a um, tax heavy talk. I had to um, pay really um, pay a lot of attention to trying to um, catch up the flows. Um, so um, um, I think we're going to move to the uh, Q&A section. Um, is there any questions anyone has? Uh, otherwise, I'll just uh, throw a couple in um, um, to start with. I have quite a few random, well, just all over the place, the, 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 the questions. So I start, some of, I think they're all probably quite simple and silly. Um, so with two, for the two benchmarks, uh, there's two F64 and I32. This integer 32 bits? Yes, yeah, so yeah, very mentioned this. and double precision oh. floating points. Um, I, I should have mentioned that I was mainly interested in double precision floats um, since I needed floating point numbers. And if you do single precision um, with large arrays, you start running into some accuracy issues. Um, but it's interesting to compare to the 32 bit data since sometimes these algorithms are used for that case. Right, right. Um, Okay, um, another question I had was um, relating to, so we have this two, uh, um, so from the very beginning you mentioned about the linear, uh, linear search algorithm, which uh, is, I think you showed us about uh, complexities ON, yep. something like that. Yep. Um, I was wondering, so, um, I guess we have like a, the sort of trade-off thing here. Once uh, linear search, it's uh, in terms of complexity, is it better than this um, um, the scan? No, so it is still ON. Um, so right. if you see here, as we asymptote, um, so here we've got kind of overhead limiting our speed, but as we start getting to the point where we're asymptoting and saturating the GPU, we are at ON still. Okay, okay, so, okay. Right, right, right. It's right. just ON with a lot, a smaller prefactor, yep. um, since we're doing a lot of things in parallel. Right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, remind me to just ask another question. Um, so in so in the performance uh, um, benchmarks, do you have an optimal um, upper bound for how how much throughput you can get? Um, so it really depends. Um, so if I come back down uh, here. So we know the CUB algorithm is essentially the throughput of a memory copy. Um, yep. So if we if we need to touch all the data in our array, then our upper upper bound is essentially the CUB algorithm, or maybe very slightly above it. Um, we can't really do much better than that if we're reading and writing every element in the array. Um, yep. But if we start doing things like um, only writing back half the elements, then we can start getting more speed up. Um, so it becomes a question of how many elements do you want to process per thread, um, where you process, say, four or eight elements per thread and then only write back one. Mm -hmm. That's reducing your memory transactions. Um, and by doing that, you can get more speed up. 
um, to a point. At some point, you'll start having more processing time than um, what it takes to read the memory, and then it's not much point going further. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. Um, mm. So there's a question in the chat from Maruf. Um, uh -huh. So the data for this benchmarking was just randomly generated data. Um, so essentially, I generate a vector of random numbers that would definitely fit within, it's like say in 32, I'd make sure that they'll actually sum up to something that fits within a 32 integer. Um, it was a fair random number uh, generator, so it's kind of like evenly distributed across the n elements. Um, and each benchmark started from the same seed, so it's all benchmarked on the same data. Um, some of it ran over more iterations than others. I was just waiting until the error converged within a small percentage. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a fairly fair uh, data distribution between it. Are there more questions? Please feel free to mute yourself. Uh, we, I think we'll have a um, quite much time uh, left. So yeah, feel free to throw in questions. Yeah, sorry, I think I talked, talked a little bit fast, or faster than I planned. Well, I guess it, yeah, that, this is one thing like you're showing lava codes. Um, if you really want to go to details, then then you need love, much more time to go through the details. So I guess you really just uh, swatting through. <laughs> yeah, I think anyone interested, um, as I said, yeah, code is there. Uh, feel free to go and take a look. Um, so all of or slightly more rigorous implementations of the code examples in here um, are all part of this repository. Um, how, how, oh, we, we, without actually um, actually clicking the link, how 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 big is, it, is this code? Uh, it's not huge, um, and it's fairly well divided up. So each algorithm is kind of in a separate file. Um, I'm happy to click the link and have a quick look if you're interested. Oh yes. Um, um, uh, yeah, because I'm wondering if it's embedded into a bigger um, application. Um, Code or oh, no, 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 no. So this is a specific, this is a specific benchmarking code specifically right. for making all of these plots. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Um, Maruf has another question. Uh, you want me to just read out? Um, do you have any future work? Um, I don't plan on taking this any further. Um, since it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit made redundant by the cub algorithm since. The, these optimizations are equally applicable to the cub code. Um, there's not really much point in doing it when the cub code can do everything it can, um, but generically, so it'll it'll actually do the full scan um, and it can do it over many different use cases. Um, so I, I don't think it's worth taking further at this point. Um, but if if something comes up, maybe I'll end up going further with it then. Oh well. Oh, is this so uh, all this um, um, implementation done so far is um, one GPU? Yep. Um, if you want to extend to multiple GPUs, would there be any significant changes? You have to um, um, use other uh, MPI for, for example, other tools. So uh, it wouldn't way. be wouldn't be a huge difference. Um, so I think the strategy would be that you store half the array on each GPU if you have two GPUs, for example, um, and then you can read out the aggregate from each GPU, um, which incurs a little bit of overhead, but relatively minor. Um, you take that aggregate and you sum it on the CPU, choose your random number, and then depending on where that random number lands, you know which GPU holds the data, and then you can just search back in that GPU. Okay, yep. 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 Oh, I guess in a sense, because you literally just treat each GPU as one scan block. Yeah. 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 Um, um, I was a bit lost when you mentioned the chunk, chunk size. Um, how, how did you pick that number? Because that chunk size also. Uh, is a parameter of your um, memory transactions. Uh, yes. Right? Um, yeah. So the, the chunk size. Um, so
So in Cuda, you'll define like you, you'll launch a kernel and it has blocks of blockdim.x threads. Um, so chunk size will just be two times your blockdim. Um, so to go back to the code, uh, actually let's go to the simple code. Um, so here, for example, if we have four threads, our chunk yep. size would be eight, since that's how many pieces of data those four threads are able to process. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we're starting from all four threads do work, then we half D and two threads do work, half D, one thread does work for the last final sum. Um, so that's this part here. So four threads, two threads, one thread. Right, right, okay. Okay, so you, you really can't tune the chunk size for this. Um, Even the yeah, I, I play with it a little bit. Um, there might be some more. I, I didn't go too much detail with it. Um, and but I think generally, bigger seems to be better um, to an extent. A thousand twenty four was slightly slower than five hundred and twelve. Mm -hmm. um, but the memory transaction was also is a um, function of the chunk sizes. So in that sense, oh, if I remember correctly, if you have a big chunk size then that gives uh, smaller memory. Yes. Um, well, uh, for the case of the partial algorithm, yes. Um, and I guess, yeah, for the others as well. The, 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 so the, the main memory transaction is still order N. Um, yeah. And then you have the additional thing that's a function of the chunk size. Ah, um, right. But I, I think that there's also some limitations there in like the more chunks you have, um, so within a chunk, you can do a sync threads, um, and that's synchronizing warps, where a warp is 32 mm -hmm. threads. Mm -hmm. um, so the more you have, if they get a little bit out of time, then they have to wait for each other on a sync. Um, maybe there's other things that go wrong. I, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact details, um, but it's not necessarily better always to have more threads in this block. Okay, okay. Right. Um you're right, I guess also just you, yeah, well, you, you probably really have to just play it well, try and error, find it the yeah, a little bit, yeah, yeah, and um, it's probably even hardware dependent. So, on older GPUs, um, maybe you're less memory bounded, more processor bounded, and then you have to do things a little differently, okay, yep, yep. Can you just show us the uh, Git um, the page again? I, I, I'm, take, take, I'm gonna take a screenshot on that one. Uh, which one, sorry? Uh, the Git, uh, your Git repo. All oh, right. Um, I think it's gonna be a good resource to start a bit GPU computing. Now, let's take a quick screenshot. Well, the slides will be available anyway. Um, yeah. Um, but before that, I'll. <laughs> um, Okay, um, are there more questions from the audience? Sorry, I probably occupy the, the, the channel for quite a bit. <laughs> okay. um, so if um, there's no other questions, um, I'll just uh, call it a day. Um, thanks again for for Stephen to give this uh, wonderful talk. Um, hopefully I can catch you at some point about um, GPU, mm, GPU programming questions. That sounds good. All right, um, thanks everyone for attending this. Um, bye for this time. Our, our next Tech Talk, uh, tech Take series is about months away. We'll send out um, notifications when it's getting closer. Thank you. Thanks.